Hi friends! My name is Issa and I am a disabled writer and advocate and on this channel I talk a lot about disability culture and identity. I have my master's degree in communication studies with a focus in disability culture and identity and organizational communication and I talk a lot about those subjects. However, I rarely actually talk about my diagnosis and I've gotten this comment a couple of times asking what my diagnosis is. So today I thought I would share a bit of my diagnosis story. It is a story. So grab your popcorn, grab your drinks, settle in because it's an event. Anyway, um, and in that I hope it kind of helps explain why I don't talk about it that much because it is a lot. My washing machine just got turned on ignore that. Anyway, so let me set the scene for you. The year is 1998. We are in July. I am between two and four weeks late because the doctors can't agree on how late I actually am because I'm so tiny. When I am born, the point is I am born uh, late and <laughs> I was seven pounds and some odd ounces. I don't know. It was small. And when I was at the hospital, I had blood sugar issues. The doctors and nurses didn't say anything to my parents. Um, it's not terribly uncommon for uh, newborns to be having blood sugar issues, but it was just a little bit predictive of how everything else went. So um, as soon as I came home, I was incredibly sick. I was throwing up everywhere all the time, projectile vomiting on the dog. If you have an issue with throw up, I'm so sorry. This is probably time for you to end the video right here because it happened a lot and it is a big part of my medical journey. So, um, point is for the first several months of my life, I was very sick. And anytime my parents talked about it, particularly my mom, um, and my parents were barely 21. Um, the doctor's like, no, there, she's your first kid. She's not that bad. She's fine. She's fine. She's fine. Finally get to a point where the doctors, um, I was at the hospital, I got sent home, my mom's like, she's still very sick, and they're like, no, she's fine, but you can bring her back in, and we'll just have someone watch her overnight. Thankfully, my parents did not listen to that, because by the time that I had made it to the nearest major hospital, um, that was the first time I almost died because of how low my blood sugar was. It was in the 20s, um, I believe, and so because of that event, that led me to going to an endocrinologist who... Um, wanted to do a fasting study, did the fasting study in office, so not at the hospital, in the office. And in the midst of doing that fasting study, what we found out <laughs> is my blood sugar would dropped and didn't recover on its own, which was part of the discovery that would needed to happen. But also my body does not respond to their um, major dealing with it thing called glucagon. Glucagon makes your body break down stored fats and turn it into glucose. It triggers that response. However, my body doesn't do that. So after two rounds of glucagon, they gave me glucose. They gave me, I think, two rounds of glucose. I'm not sure. I was a bit out of it and a bit young for this experience. Um, and that was the second time I almost died. And there's like various other illnesses and things where I was at the hospital. Um, but those are the two major ones that led to me getting diagnosed with what is a fatty acid oxidation defect called LCHAT. Um, and that is the story behind this scar that's over here in my tattoo. Um, so they took a skin biopsy while that was happening, um, which came positive for LCHAD. They retested it and they're like, actually, no, it's not LCHAD. And then at some point we ended up at the Mayo Clinic and the Mayo Clinic people were saying that um, it's not LCHAD, but it is definitely something um, in that area. So it was I was re-diagnosed with um, more of a general diagnosis of mitochondrial disease, which if you are unfamiliar with mitochondrial disease, mitochondrial disease is, you know, the mitochondria, the little, the fun powerhouse to the cell. Yeah, mine doesn't work. Um, she's out for lunch. It, she does not want to function very well. And so um, I was my specific symptoms, because mitochondrial disease can affect every part of your body, was majorly my um, blood sugar. I had low muscle tone. I had some other problems. And around the time I got the diagnosis for LCHAD, um, my mom at that appointment was heavily pregnant with my next sibling and was like, hey, by the way, is this genetic? And uh, the doctor said, yeah, 
but um, we'll talk about that in the next appointment, which was after my sister was born. And so um, we tested my sister. Turns out sister has the same thing, actual levels. She was healthier than I was appearing, um, but her levels were worse than mine. And so my poor parents, mostly my mother, were having to get up every few hours every night to give us shots of whatever the version of glucose we were doing at the time. There's a couple different options um, to keep us alive. And so um, I got a port placement um, because I was in and out of the hospital so much and I was having so many health issues. And then um, I went on my Make-A-Wish trip when I was four and my mom is pregnant with my last sibling and um time that my youngest sibling was being born my middle sibling and i were both having surgeries to get g-tube placed and g-tubes changed our life suddenly we were no longer on the edge of failure to thrive we were flourishing we were doing wonderfully i got my port removed um and all of these beautiful things now let's back it up to my other symptom is puking i still was puking everywhere i was puking after every single meal and um that is not good and causes a lot of issues and so um we moved to texas because we needed to move closer to a major medical space and we decided to go for texas and um i say we my parents um and anyway so they move our small family over down to texas I do some testing in Texas and uh, cook children's to see what's going on with my stomach um, and why I can't hold down food. And um, we get the test results back because the whole test I was throwing up and my mom's like, finally, we're going to get some answers. Normal. Completely normal is what they said. Um, when my mom followed up on it, apparently um, it was inconclusive. They just said normal because I was throwing up so much that they couldn't get the test results. Anyway, so skipping that part, we went to a different doctor in Dallas instead. And that doctor offered um, to do a fund application, a Neeson fund application, which helped kind of like make it so that you can't throw up anymore. And when they went to do that, they found out that my um, esophagus was so stretched out and that's why I wasn't holding down any food. And so between those two procedures, I was able to finally kind of like get back to normal um, and the fundo is not a fun procedure it is very hard if you know anyone who has ever had a fundo please just give them extra love just be extra nice to them because of my childhood there are two things that I distinctly remember as the worst pains in my life and one is the fundo and the other is the time that my um, g-tube stoma got infected um, so just give them extra love but that surgery completely changed my life. So going back to the mitochondrial disease. So I was diagnosed with generalized mitochondrial disease. Now here's the thing is that I saw a doctor, a geneticist at Mayo Clinic. His name um, is Dr. Whiteman. He was one of the top geneticists in the nation. He said that my um, diagnosis was just gonna have to wait for science to catch up with me because whatever I have, obviously my younger siblings both have as well. And um, we've done genetic testing and everything, and every single time someone, some doctor is like, this is too advanced, they send us off to a specialist. The specialist, whose job it is to find zebras, gets very, very excited because they're like, I'm going to finally diagnose you, and they can't. Um, and every single time it comes back to, we just got to wait on science to catch up with you, which is a very frustrating experience to be in. And this, I think, is part of the reason why I don't like talking about my diagnosis, just because in part I've gotten some messages, or not messages, but like I've been told by some doctors that I might not even have mitochondrial disease. I might have something completely different um, that just looks like mitochondrial disease, but we don't know. We can't find out. And so the diagnosis for mitochondrial disease gives me everything that I need. It gets me access to the doctors I need to see. It gets me access to the medical care I need. And so the, my wheelchair, all of that, mitochondrial disease, that diagnosis helps me. However, at the end of the day, I'm still sitting here at 24, almost 25, kind of undiagnosed. And I have a long history of getting better and then progression and getting better and progression and getting better and progression. And it is a progressive disability. Whatever I have, 
has progressed since I was a child and we expect it to progress. And the last time I saw a geneticist who was from, who's a neurologist geneticist from Ireland who was visiting, um, he was very, very excited about um, getting me a diagnosis. And um, he said that he thought I had a had something that if I could just get treatment for it and get treatment the right way, then it completely changes um, my life expectations. <laughs> and I at least may be able to stabilize and not progress anymore and have different outcomes than mitochondrial disease because mitochondrial disease is a very, very scary diagnosis for someone who was diagnosed as long as young as I was. The expectation, the life expectancy for someone as symptomatic as I was with mitochondrial disease was not great at the time I was born. Um, and it's gotten a little bit better, but I am of a generation of people with Mito who really shouldn't have survived, um, or at least weren't expected to. And so it's hard talking about the diagnosis. Partly emotionally, yeah, sure, but it's also just difficult to talk about it because a lot of people just don't understand what it is to be in this weird middle ground. And I am so paranoid about someone accusing me of being, of faking my illness, of faking my disability. And sometimes I even wonder, like, am I faking my disability? Is this all in my head? Am I really just fat? Am I this? Am I that? And then I have things happen, like, last week I took, tried a new medication for the first time. Um, and the only time I will ever be trying that medication. And it was fuel for my nightmares. Um and it triggered a reaction that only was possible because there is something wrong with me. And anyway, so that is my diagnosis story and that's where I am in my diagnosis journey. I'm not actively trying to find an official diagnosis. Um, it'd be nice to know what's going on, but um, mostly I just try to treat the symptoms because at the end of the day, if it is a mitochondrial disease, a form of mitochondrial disease, all they really can do is treat the symptoms and hope for the best and hope that medical advancements are going to be able to give the treatment that I need. So, yep, that's where I'm at. That's my diagnosis story. That is me. Hope you guys have a great day. I don't talk about this stuff a lot. So if you would like to hear about disability culture stuff, um, and I'm trying to be more open about my personal experience with my disability, but I struggle with the embodied part. And so anyway, if you'd like to come with me on that journey on like balancing my advocacy with embodied disability experiences, subscribe down below. We are in for a journey. Bye. <laughs>